Hello everyone, this is Timothy Mark with Alexandria. How is everybody doing today? I hope they're doing great. Yep, and we are a World Paranormal Research Society, and that is worldparanormalresearchsociety.org org is our website. And the YouTube channel is World Paranormal Research Society. Um, I don't know what the hell is going on with YouTube. Um, YouTube has gotten into the business of ripping people off now and stealing views if you enter any kind of monetizations on uh, YouTube you'll understand there's a lot of youtubers out there and, and granted I've been you I've been a youtuber since 2008 three I've lost three of my channels and uh, I'll tell you they do that because they don't want to pay you they don't want to pay you the money that they owe you for placing the ads now they recently changed up the rules, but the funny thing is, like, usually when we release a podcast on the YouTube, we'll get like 100 views within the first eight hours. Well, YouTube ends up taking those views. What happens is they reset them, and so you'll see a reset, and in, in the next day or, or two days later, it'll be like 34 when it was 100 or something. So there's some screwy shit going on with YouTube. Uh, but YouTube is just one of the platforms that we release this podcast on. We're on Tumblr, iTunes, and we're on uh, uh, Spreaker. So we get a lot of listeners on Spreaker. So that's good. But I don't know how much longer we're going to be utilizing YouTube just for a simple fact. There is other media platforms out there. And we may be switching to a different one. But uh, on today's topic... We're going to talk about Frankenstein. And so I'll let Alexandria kick that off. Uh, as you remember, uh, last time uh, we talked about Dracula, and Dracula and vampires are a passion of mine. But, you know, I really have to say any kind of uh, creature or maybe a grotesque almost creature, but I don't think he, I don't really consider Frankenstein grotesque in the true sense of the word. Uh, and really, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history on Frankenstein. Um, Frankenstein basically is a novel written by the English author Mary Shelley. And Mary Shelley lived from 1797 to 1851. And her tale tells the story of Victor Frankenstein, who is a young scientist who creates... Uh, I don't really like this word grotesque. And again, he's not grotesque. He's just a different being in a really unorthodox or an unconventional scientific experiment. And you have to remember, in the time of Mary Shelley, I mean, her novel was uh, 1818. Like, can you imagine, let's put two uh, points into perspective. Uh, the time frame is 1818, and she's a woman. So a lot of people at that particular time when this novel came out, uh, at that time frame, how could they even fathom that a woman uh, could write uh, a novel about uh, a, a being or uh, a monster, or I put monster in uh, uh, quotations, because he's not a true monster to me. Uh, so, I mean, that's two things that was very innovative, and she was way, way ahead of her time in regards to... Well, let's talk, let's talk about the look of Frankenstein's monster, because Frankenstein refers to the scientist. Frankenstein's creature or monster is what some people think of as Frankenstein and if you go back since you just brought up Mary Shelley if you go go back and actually look at the revised book version of her book it gives a picture of what Frankenstein looked like and it's a much different picture than what Universal Pictures ended up using even though even though Mary Shelley created a story of Frankenstein Universal Pictures create the image that we all associate with the word Frankenstein. And it really being Frankenstein's monster. But go ahead. Yeah, but you have to really kind of put this into perspective too because when Mary <coughs> Shelley wrote this true gothic novel, the main character at that time was Victor Frankenstein. It wasn't the monster. It was actually the scientist Victor Frankenstein. So her, her focus on the novel was not the creature, but the scientist. And, and, and going back to the look of the creature again, if everybody out there is familiar with the monsters, you know that Fred Gwynn was actually a pretty tall actor by himself. He was actually pretty tall. <clears throat> I don't know his exact height, but he wore a platform 
shoes or boots to give him more height because Mary Shelley described a creature as being eight foot tall. And really, I mean, uh, the novel brings into the forefront how ingenious uh, uh, Victor Frankenstein was as, as a scientist because he really was studying the decay of living uh, things. So he really uh, wanted to, you know, you study how things decay. There's a process. We all know that there's a process on how bodies decay, you know, when maggots form, flies, etc. But he was really fascinated with that process of, uh, and he wanted to really gain an insight into the creation of life and to kind of give life to things that have started to decay. And I find that absolutely fascinating because myself, I have a fascination with mummification and that's something a whole different genre <coughs> on its own. But that is a fascination with decaying items. And, uh, you know, going back to the fact that Frankenstein's monster, the creature that we now call Frankenstein today, was nameless. Uh, in, the, in the story that Mary Shelley wrote, um, it, it, the creature was not given a name other than creature. However, the creature tries to name itself Adam. It says, I, sh I shall be your Adam. I should be your Adam. But can, can you really imagine? I mean, this fascinates me to no end because Mary Shelley, I mean, at this time in 1818, came up with this true Gothic novel. Like, I, I, I really think it's amazing. And it said that she traveled through Europe in 1814 and she took a long journey along the, the Rhine River in Germany. And actually, um, she made a stop. Uh, about 17 kilometers away from Frankenstein Castle where it is alleged that two centuries before an alchemist was engaged in various experiments so I think when you know she journeyed to the Rhine and was so close to the actual Frankenstein Castle can you imagine hearing stories of an alchemist doing various uh, experiments I you know I I would be just completely fascinated and maybe that was the beginning point that was four years prior to this gothic novel coming out where she you know all these ideas were swirling in her in her head and uh, you know I'm a writer Timothy's a writer I mean we are like sponges for things that we see we listen different environments and we may not think of doing a, a, a book at that time but it really stays in your mind and it may set the foundation for something you, you know years in the making that you come up with an idea of a fascinating story that you think the masses would be wanting to read about well let me tell you uh, since we're going back to the we, we're kicking this off from the originals and stuff and, and, and looking at what predates Mary Shelley if you look at the doctors of that time they were experimenting with uh, trying to bring people back to life and uh, and, and, I mean, it was it was very cruel and unusual. It would seem cruel and unusual practices that doctors had that they would experiment on their patients. And uh, although, you know, uh, every every doctor I think has wanted to learn how to bring something back from the dead. And uh, but since we're going back to and talking about Mary Shelley, let's talk about when you when you think of Frankenstein, who do you think of? It's the it's the most it's, it's the first character to to play Frankenstein. What do you mean character? I mean I uh, mean the first actor to play Frankenstein. I I don't know. Was it? Uh, I'm just trying to think of the name. I had the name right at the tip of my tongue, and I'm I'm so fascinated with. Most people would say Boris Karloff. However, the first actor to ever play Fra Frankenstein in a film, and this was in 1910, was in Thomas Edison's film Frankenstein, was Charles Stanton Ogle. And he was the first uh, actor to play uh, Frankenstein, Charles Stanton Ogle. See, I, that, that's a bit of trivia uh, for you. And uh, getting back to Mary Shelley again, I mean, uh, what better PR or to get a message across than a contest or a competition? And all of us writers out there, there's very, you know, there's tons of writing competitions. And it is said that, um, you know, they used to have uh, conversations among her friends about different occult ideas. And her lover and her future husband, Percy Shelley and uh, Lord Byron, they decided to have a competition to see who could write the best horror story. So after thinking, you know, for days and days, it is said that uh, Mary Shelley had a dream 
about a scientist who created life and uh, her <coughs> dream it is alleged later evolved into the basis or the you know the foundation or the skeleton as as it were of this novel story and it really to me Frankenstein the novel in my mind it really uh, brings together or it infuses uh, real true elements of a true gothic novel along with you know there's romantic element in that novel so that that's kind of winning or key selling points in a good romantic gothic novel let's look at how uh, Frankenstein in the story of Mar Mary Shelley was uh, brought the story that Mary Shelley brought wrote Frankenstein let's look at uh, how the creature was brought to life if he wasn't brought to life using out uh, electricity he was brought to life using alchemy and uh, we do know that we we've talked about alchemy before and uh, that was a very common practice among uh, the the years of uh, the Mary Shelley was living was alchemy there was a lot of people using practicing alchemy just like there is today that's true and I mean just picture yourself like I mean close close your eyes really and just picture yourself sitting by a roaring log fire and it said that uh, a bunch you know they were sitting by Lord Byron's uh, log fire at his villa and uh, you know it, the friends were kind of amusing themselves by reading German uh, ghost stories and uh, you know they decided on uh, Mary uh, Shelley became kind of anxious and was just wondering how she could come up with uh, a story that would you know really uh, bring to the forefront and I think that's absolutely amazing and uh, that's when she started to write the novel in regards to Frankenstein and as Timothy Timothy brought to the forefront um, the name of uh, the monster was not Frankenstein at the beginning I mean he was just called the monster because it was basically on um, the creature the creature and I mean uh, that's I think that's absolutely uh, fascinating and she described him as being eight foot tall uh, being an ugly creation with translucent translucent yellowish skin uh, watery eyes glowing eyes and uh, flowing black hair black lips with prominent white teeth um, even if you're taking body parts and putting them back together I don't know how the lips would turn black but it, apparently that's uh, how she she seen the, the creature and I mean part of uh uh, the uh, Frankenstein Fra Frankenstein's rejection of his creation is the fact that he didn't give it a name at the beginning. So really, how can you say you've created something when you can't even give it a name? So that was part of that. I mean, there was words like wretch, monster, creature, uh, demon, devil, fiend. I mean, all those names were called prior to uh, given uh, him, you know, taking over the, the Frankenstein. And 21 years after the first Frankenstein film, 21 years after the first Frankenstein film, Boris Kar Kar Karloff, uh, 1930s, he played him through the 30s, but in 31 in particular, he played Frankenstein. And that's where you have the square head, the bolts coming out the side, the scar coming down the middle, and things of that nature. And that's, that's the image that everybody recognizes today. Right, I mean, that that's so far from... Uh what Mary Shelley had envisioned or what she really had put in in her novel so that's interesting to bring that uh, difference to everybody's mind because we now we all think of Frankenstein as the monster and the most important thing to note is Universal Studios created that look and with them creating that look and that's why when you see Frankenstein movies after the 30s that was not a Universal Pictures film because any film company can do a Frankenstein film but not any company itself for Universal can use that look without Universal's permission that's why when Robert De Niro I believe he played Frankenstein in a film he, he, he had a completely different look and uh, even in uh, the, the Frankenstein film that came out a few years back the guy had a different look because Universal Pictures if they weren't doing the film they was not going to give up their creation their Frankenstein look and uh uh, from a historic or a mythological point of view, I always like to throw uh, a mythological or legend uh, into our podcast. It's very, very important as well. And uh, it says that uh, the Titan in Greek mythology 
uh, of Prometheus parallels Victor Frankenstein, and uh, r really why, how it parallels that is that um, uh, Victor's work by creating man by new means reflects the same innovative work of the Titan in creating he uh, humans. So that's in Greek mythology how it is uh, proposed. <coughs> pardon me, that the Titans created human beings. So they're saying that. Uh, Victor Frankenstein tried to use that same technology that has been lost in time. And uh, <clears throat> Mary Shelley wrote the character Frankenstein based on her husband, Percy Shelley. Um, Percy Shelley was a, one of the major English romantic po poets uh, of the time, of, between the early 1800s, so the turn of the century there. And I mean, uh, you know, as we go into... Um, uh, something that I didn't really uh, think of before and I mean I, I'm going to give you a little bit of time timelines too I mean um, in 1823 Richard Brinsley Peake's uh, adaptation uh, Presumption or the Fate of Frankenstein was actually seen by Mary Shelley and her father uh, William Godwin at the English Opera House and that was in 1823 and uh, also in 1826 Henry M. Milner's adaptation of The Man and the Monster or The Fate of Frankenstein actually opened July 3rd at the Royal Coburg Theatre in London. So this is just giving you a timeline of different different plays and uh, something that Timothy made known to me and I was quite grateful that he sort of uh, gave me that information. He mentioned uh, in 1910 about Edison Studios. Maybe you want to go into uh, Thomas Edison in 1910. I uh, know we, yeah. He made the first Frankenstein film, and, thing, and he also was the very first pornographer. But uh, it's, it's, if you look at the critics uh, of the time when they were reviewing Mary Shelley's work, uh, they did not they they attacked it, and uh, they they did not like the work. But regardless of what the critics said about the book, I mean, it stood the test of time, and uh, basically, it's outlived those critics for sure. You know, and uh, so again, we have Charles Ogle as the first monster in Frankenstein. The second guy who played him was Boris Karloff. I'm sure everybody knows Boris Karloff. Um, uh, before that, there was uh, there was plays, uh, Presumption or the Fate of Frankenstein, and uh, yeah, there was Frankenstein. Or the Vampire's Victim was in 1887, and th these were plays. And uh, the play Frankenstein or the Vampire's Victim was a musical burlesque play. And uh, it was after that in 1910, Edison Studios produced the first Frankenstein film. And in 1915, you have Life Without Soul, and uh, you know nobody can seem to find that one. Um, this is missing so if you can find it be very interesting to get a hold of it and uh, save it for history's sake in 1920 you have the monster of Frankenstein uh, silent film and then in 1931 you have Uni Universal Studios Frankenstein and then in 1935 now this is my favorite Frankenstein film the 1935 film it was called The Bride of Frankenstein. I think everybody knows that classic look with the bride. It's got the hair slicked up and backwards and look like she stuck her finger in a socket and got that uh, what that white going up the sides. I think that, you know what, I love that hairdo and uh, you know, I'm, I I wish I could have hair like that because uh, I, I find that woman completely beautiful. I mean, if that makes sense to everybody. It's just well, that it's, well, a, lot of, a lot of people's had tattoos of that woman. Man, I was going to have one at one time. Uh, but uh, and it follows the the Chucky series really follows the way Frankenstein series was made because you have Chucky the Bride of Chucky then you have the offspring of Chucky because in 1935 like I said you had the Bride of Frankenstein in 1939 you have the Son of Frankenstein and then in 1942 you have the Ghost of Frankenstein uh, now what's 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 important to notice about the 1942 film can compared to the 30s the, all the films in the 30s was in 1942 was the first time that Boris Karloff since the 30s since playing him in the 30s did not play Frankenstein because now you have Lon Chaney Jr. playing 
Frankenstein. And uh, Bella Lugosi was even in the film. So <clears throat> if you have a chance to get the Ghost of Frankenstein, you should get it. Uh, it's definitely a different take when you got Lon, Lon Chaney Jr. and Bella Lugosi. I'm sure Boris Karloff didn't, did not like that too much. And then uh, 1942 to 1948, you have Frankenstein meets the, the Wolfman. And then you have House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, which Frankenstein plays in. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. The last three fr films introduce Glenn Strange as Frankenstein's monster. So there you have, uh, you know, Lon Chaney left, and then you have Glenn Strange playing the monster. And you know, to put this into perspective too, we really have to truly say this, that uh, uh, Mary Shelley's uh, novel Frankenstein mm. was really the world's first true science fiction novel. I think we can be unanimous in thinking that at that time frame in 1818, that's the world's first uh, science uh, fiction novel. And really, I mean, the way I view Frankenstein in my own mind is that he's really uh, a gentle, kind of an intellectual, uh, gifted creature that unfortunately is just enormous and he's physically hideous but he's on the search for love so he's really a freak of uh, nature uh, you know seeking what we all seek is acceptance and uh, in love I'll tell you this uh, <clears throat> Hammer Films yeah it, it, definitely in love because now that you say Hammer Films Hammer Films put a whole different spin on Frankenstein that's that's where he was more it, it, it introduced the more romantic side if you will, of Frankenstein. But I'm not a big fan of the Hammer Films Frankensteins because now you're having a change of the uh, of the looks. And uh, we seen the movie The Revenge of Frankenstein the other night, and that sucked. That movie was so horrible. And I think it's because uh, Swingoli was hosting it, and who the hell is Swingoli, oh and why God. they got that guy in there? I was so disappointed. I, you know, I was so looking forward to see that, and uh, I just, I couldn't even finish it. Yeah, that movie definitely sucked. But when you're looking at the Hammer films, that they they made the Frankenstein films between the era of 1957 and 1974. Now, Hammer Films has put out a lot of great horror films. The Revenge of Frankenstein is not one of them, but their first Frankenstein film was The Curse of Frankenstein. Then you have The Revenge of Frankenstein. Then you have Frankenstein Must Be uh, Destroyed. <clears throat> and, and again, it's just a whole different uh, take and look, and it's, it's, I, I was not too, uh, too impressed with it. In 1965, you have Toho Studios, and they put Frankenstein Conquers the World. And then in 1972, you have the comedic stage adaption, Frankenstein's Monster, and then you have 1973, The Frankenstein, The True Story, appeared on NBC. Now, I've never seen Frankenstein, The True Story. It's a little odd that they say Frankenstein, The True Story, because it's a TV film, and we all know that Mary Shelley made up the story. So, you know. Another thing that I find fascinating is that Mary Shelley really makes a point of stressing this in her gothic novel that uh, the the methods that Victor Frankenstein used to build this creature were consisting of chemistry and alchemy. She was quite specific to use those terminology as chemistry and alchemy and uh, she makes sure that she uh, describes the monster as eight feet tall hideously ugly but again stressing the point that he's very sensitive and emotional and I think a lot of us can relate to that fact today with uh, body image and how people you know some of the most beautiful people inside uh, may not have the best body, bodies on the outside but certainly uh, there's a message that is very true in any generation that uh, beauty is truly skin deep and then when you, you know, and a lot of these people got it wrong. I mean, you know, obviously Universal Pictures got the story wrong, but that's the most famous and the most popular version of Frankenstein. It's actually my favorite version of Frankenstein. But in 1994, you had Mary Shelley's Frankenstein come up, and uh, it was directed and was starring Kenneth Branagh and Robert De Niro and Helen Bonham Carter. You have an all-star cast there, 
but they got it wrong again because Robert De Niro was bald headed. If you uh, look at the description <clears throat> Mary Shelley gave, he had long, flowing black hair. Now, what's what's weird about it is they called it Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as if you were to believe that this is the closest story to the original story, and uh, so you can be fooled by some of these titles. So yeah, I mean we have <clears throat> to we have to remember too that uh, contrary to. To the many many film versions that are out there uh, the creature that Mary Shelley uh, portrays in her novel is very articulate and eloquent in his way of speaking and it says that uh, immediately after his creation he's able to dress himself and within 11 months he can speak and read German and French and it says uh, by the end of the novel the creature appears to be able to speak English fluently as well so again she really goes out of her way to portray um, the creature as somebody that is very eloquent uh, and uh, very intelligent he's not the uh, dumb uh, you know monster or creature that some of the films are saying that he really is yeah they uh well, you know, that's again, you got Mary Shelley's story saying all this stuff, and then you have Universal Pictures is the first one. Well, I, even in Edison's one, we don't get the idea that the creature is stupid. But in the Universal films, we get the idea that the creature is stupid. And so, yeah, but again, that's the most popular one because it's got the best look, and they really knew what they were doing when they, uh, they developed that look. Um, with the flat head and the bolts on the side and uh, like I said a lot of people as you purchased artwork with that on it uh, I've had it permanently put in their skin and all that stuff but what I want to talk about is how close did her story come to a reality because if anybody reads Time Magazine Time Magazine last year put out an article of this man who's having a head transplant you can google it uh, he's actually transplanting his head onto another body. Now, in The Revenge of Frankenstein, the story that we did not like, uh, they were taking the man's brain and putting it into another uh, a head. Now, that, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that for several reasons because you got the uh, where the spinal cord attaches and all that. There's a lot of problems doing that. It's easier to do the head transplant. So, uh, scientists are still trying to figure out how to do the brain transplant plant on a human and make it uh work but I, I can't wait to see this guy who's having the first head transplant done they've done it on animals and it's succeeded now they're actually doing it on a human and uh, hopefully that'll be uh take place this year that's when uh timothy told me uh about that i mean i was very fascinating i mean that's uh i don't think that's something that i personally would like to have done on me but i mean science has to move forward and uh you know, it, it, it's just fascinating, and I think, you know, 200 years later, uh, after this novel came to, to, to light, I mean, uh, we have to remember that uh, uh, these uh, processes or uh, scientific innovations will continue to shock us and kind of inspire us in great awe, and I mean, I think if they can... Uh, do that in the future I mean people that have different illnesses uh, uh, you know I think that will be highly beneficial I mean I think that's really it'll bring to the forefront a really mixed bag on who is for that and who is not for that I mean uh, but uh, it is uh, maybe ra something very radical and I mean uh, we're really talking about the, the reversal of the death process because uh, we're reanimating or we're re uh, reallocating body parts and I mean you know you remember uh, Burks and Hare in the Victorian times where they were uh, selling body parts to doctors at the time which I'm very sure were I mean that's where they learned about the human body and uh, maybe trying transplantations etc so what's your favorite version of Frankenstein I mean I think I have to uh, the Frank the original Frankenstein is is my favorite I mean uh, uh, with uh, Boris Kar Karloff, I mean, that was 1931 where, uh, you know, he really uh, created a box office sensation with Frankenstein. I mean, that was directed by James Whale, but I mean, that's my favorite version, I think, is uh, with Boris Karloff. My favorite version is Herman Monster. <laughs> 
I grew up with the monsters and I, uh, I love that show and uh, because I got to see more of the monsters than the Universal Frankenstein <clears throat> that would be my favorite you know and, and Herman Monster gives uh, the the creature intelligence and uh, and in the fact that his last name is Monster goes closer to what he was originally supposed his name's not Herman Frankenstein and then actually if you watch the series uh, he was put together by Frankenstein so it sticks closer to the truth and I mean, I think really for for a few hundred years, we've been fascinated with uh, reanimation. And I mean, uh, I, I'm going to sort of go backwards and give another historical <coughs> tidbit. In uh, 1780, there was an Italian scientist, Luigi Galvani, who uh, showed that a spark could make the muscles of a dead frog contract. And uh, I think, you know, that was well before Mary Shelley's time. But, I mean, it just goes to show you that uh, prior to that as well, or very close to, you know, 1818, there was other people that were uh, trying to reanimate. I mean, that was a frog, per se. But, I mean, uh, people were thinking of uh, triggering different chemical reactions uh, you know, trying to use uh, different means. I mean, I don't know how in 1780, I don't know what kind of spark he was using. There is actually a mechanism that he turns a mechanism uh, with a spark. So I'm not quite sure how that, that would work because um, uh, it's just uh, different than was known at that time. And I think, uh, you know, people that have actually been maybe brain dead or they're trying to resuscitate people, uh, maybe, or even people that were clinically insane. I mean, it was a different way to uh, reanimate or bring that to the forefront. Anyway, so yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, we, we all know that saying, it's alive. I remember uh, Victor Frankenstein, that's when one, and several of the movies, that's the term that's that they use it. It's the live, alive. And really, uh, uh, Mary Shelley, again, a true gothic <coughs> novel, you know, does combine science and the supernatural in uh, how she kind of conceived the idea of uh, Frankenstein. And uh, very, very, uh, you know, we all have our own. Uh, version that we like or our own uh, visual stimuli, stimuli that appeals to us and I mean uh, I really think that uh, you know Frankenstein is just a, a misfigured individual that's really looking for acceptance, acceptance and uh, love in, in a society that uh, even his uh, creator turned on him yeah no, it, man you just look at so many like today, like, okay, I'm a, I'm a veteran, but there's so many people who served in the military and went overseas, <clears throat> and they come back missing body parts. When they come back missing body parts, now they have it where they have artificial limbs that they can attach to to, to you. They can attach a brand new hand, and, you, and your your mind can control that hand. And it's, uh, it's through electrical pulses, you know, so it's, uh, it's pretty amazing that we're coming to the point now where we could take uh, and build an actual... We, today, I think we could create the Frankenstein creature. I, I think we can, and I mean, I think uh, we have to uh, really come to terms that, I mean, she has sort of given a foundation of what was later to come in regards to innovative idea <coughs> in regards to even cell regeneration and again uh, you know even attaching uh, you amputation like Timothy said about people veterans or people that are disfigured and whether it be war or different accidents that I mean there would be hope for them to have another limb and I mean I'm not against that uh, that idea either because I think if if we have the technology uh, to have that why shouldn't we use that and I mean it would benefit everybody and I mean it really makes us question I mean the bigger picture that we have to think about is what are the real uh, you know social implications of uh, this kind of scientific knowledge and I know a lot of people there's going to be a lot of debate and controversy about saying that you know you don't have a right to play God I mean these people will bring that argument to the table where I mean and where does that say that in the Bible that you don't have a right to play God. No, it doesn't, but there's a Nobody's lot of people... Nobody's playing God. They're just trying to come up with better ways to help people. 
Right, but there's always somebody that has to give a negative spin over because, you know, we let's all face it, everybody. We have to be honest with ourselves. There's, there's always been an age-old conflict over religion and science. Uh, some people have a hard time bridging that gap and uh, dissecting the difference between religion and science. And... Uh, her novel really kind of uh, explores the bo the boundary or a very thin borderline between life and death, and uh, you know how people have, may be ignorant in the fact that, like you said, they're not playing God. So it brings a lot of social issues uh, to the forefront that maybe a lot of people aren't uh, prepared to answer. And I mean, uh, who wouldn't be fascinated about being able to infuse a spark? of being into a lifeless thing that lies at your feet. I mean, <coughs> absolutely, um, it just takes you into another realm, the possibilities of reanimation. I mean, the, the possibilities are truly, truly endless. And I mean, uh, Frankenstein, to me, is almost a character of Beauty and the Beast kind of a thing. He is considered a beast or a monster, really, just wanting acceptance. I mean, he was created. He didn't ask to be created, but he was created. His creator turned his back on him. Society turned his back on him because of the way he looked. And that gives a perspective on, in today's society, how we are fascinated or uh, we are always judged. <clears throat> Never judge a book by its cover. And we, each and every one of us can say we are guilty of doing that. So that, but you say that, and you you definitely would be guilty of doing that because if you've seen a book with Russell Crowe on the cover, you definitely judge it and buy it. So there you go. Am oh. I right? So yeah, in some instances, people will judge a book by its cover, but I know what you mean. I'm no, just, but I'm I mean, just, I'm just making a joke. I know, I understand, and I take that with a grain of salt, and I understand it's a joke. But I mean, people out there that are tattooed or have different scars, that have acne, they are judged by not being socially acceptable. So Frankenstein is a creature that is not socially acceptable because of what he looks like. And like I said, I'm going to keep harping on this message because it is very wrong there, because there's people that are disfigured, uh, that have diseases. They are judged by public as not being socially acceptable or socially visually pleasing. So that sends a message out there. So I think that is another way that her novel was way before its time, uh, telling people that if somebody is, you know, very tall, <coughs> grotesque, or, uh, you know, is not socially acceptable. And we can end that on that. And what I would like to say is uh, we have an event coming up in Bryan, Texas. I'm really, really super stroked for this event because it's going to be your opportunity uh, to come and uh, drop in, have a chat with us, and to have a rune reading, and uh, it's going to be awesome. We're going to be at the Revolution Cafe. And bar. And bar. March 9th, which is this Friday. Uh, between 6 and 11 p.m. And for all of you, I can give you the address. It's 211B South Main Street, Bryan, Texas. That is your opportunity to meet us up close and personal, have a chat with us, and your opportunity to get your rune reading by me, Alexandria, and you'll be able to chat with Timothy. We will have some of uh, the many, many books that we have for purchase uh, and we'll have a few, we've got a few jars of red brick dust less, very limited actually, quantity. Actually, we've got an extremely limited and limited quantity of red brick dust. And uh, so you need to come early to get that. Um, make sure you get there early. We have limited in inventory on our books. Uh, we'll have books there and we'll have, uh, we'll, be doing, we'll be doing a uh, autograph signing too, so. Yeah, so that's uh, Revolution Cafe and Bar this Friday, March 9th, be from 6 to 11 p.m. in Bryan, Texas. So if you are within the area and you want to get a rune reading, uh, the rune readings, like I said, uh, we have, usually when we come out, they're such in high demand. Please get there early because 50, uh, did you want to go into the pricing on that or leave it? It's $20 for a 15-minute session. 
Uh, and again, in a 15 minute session, that means that we can get four people in. Usually we only get three in because sometimes we go over to 15 minutes, but you want to make sure that you spend adequate time with the person uh, and they get all their questions answered. So uh, yeah, you definitely want to get there early. Um, so that, and again, you can reserve a spot by uh, simply emailing us at World Paranormal Research Society at gmail.com and reverse reserve your spot. And another thing I wanted to mention or throw that out there because a, a few people that we speak to in passing have mentioned this. In the future, uh, I will be offering workshops and seminars on various topics. Uh, once we have those uh, kind of streamlined for you, we'll have that on our website. And uh, I want to touch on a, on a very interesting topic, and I want to throw that out to you and get some feedback. What do you think on this? This is sort of the word on the street kind of a thing. And I, I get a kick out of when we mention what we do as paranormal researchers <coughs> or uh, in quotations, uh, ghost hunters, that we get these uh, <laughs> people really don't know don't know how to to take it or quite not quite sure what we do, and some people get spooked or some people are not uh, you know sure how to look at us when they hear the word ghost hunter. So you know we get a lot of uh, positive feedback when we tell people what we do, and then we get some uh, people that are puzzled and a little bit perplexed on not really realizing what that is and I mean I've met people in the public that have different uh, responses Timothy has met people uh, with different takes or different ideas on what we do I don't know if you want to kind of talk a little bit about that on some people that you've met in passing in the public no I have to take a piss right <laughs> now so if you would just uh Go ahead. You know, that's information we may have not <laughs> needed to know, but I mean, uh, we all have uh, bodily functions that we have to <laughs> take care of. So, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out to you. And I mean, I've been doing what I do for well over 30 years. I mean, I was born with the ability. I think it's a, it's a gift and it's a curse, like yin and yang, two sides of the coin, of being able to see communicate with dead people and I, I can tell you folks I mean I, I think nothing better of it, it, it truly is a gift to help people that are uh, in need or people that are grief stricken I'm not a psychic I'm not a medium I'm actually an empath there's a huge difference and I'm not going to touch on that today that may be a future topic on a podcast but um it can it is a gift and it can be a curse because it can be uh you know i can be walking anywhere down the street and i have these uh uh people that have passed over to the other side that want me to relay messages to people so uh you know to me yes it is a gift but it can be a curse at times where you know it can be difficult to uh go through a day without having people whisper in your ears etc but um I wanted to put that out there is that, like I said, the classes and the courses that I'm hoping to offer in the very near future will be uh, very innovative, very informative, and uh, it's a way of uh, teaching knowledge. And I mean, knowledge is power, and I think there's uh, knowledge that should not be lost and uh, forgotten, you know, forgotten in the time, you know, the history of time, really. And I mean, this has been around for thousands of years, so. Part of the gift is that you should relay this knowledge to individuals that are open or that are truly awake to this. So there's two sides of this business that we do. And I mean, with everything, there's yin, yang, positive, negative. We focus on the positive. Uh, we met a lady today that was actually uh, started out being a little bit perplexed or unsure. But uh, by the end of a very short conversation, I mean, uh, <coughs> we've picked up another individual that's willing to learn or is quite curious on exactly what entails our everyday life as paranormal researchers. Yes, yeah, she's going to stop in and see us tomorrow. So, uh, yep, that's, that's that. And uh, so, uh-huh. There, I'm glad that he's back at the table here. But, you know, we really strive and we really think it's important to bring topics that kind of make you think, make you ask questions, make you ponder, and make you realize that there's not always one 
true source for everything out there really you know know what you're talking about or research i mean just go don't go to one source again i always harp on the fact read books they are not extinct folks uh, there's nothing better than to curl, curl up to a book i mean uh, we all get sick and tired of looking at computer screens so please uh, pick up a book. I mean, I have a lot of rare books that I've been reading for many, many years, and they're very instrumental in my journey, in my spiritual journey of uh, the knowledge, and I'm continuing to learn on a daily basis. Yeah, I'm continuing to learn on a daily basis, too. <clears throat> and uh, So what I learned today was blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I, um, what can I what I, was, say about, what, yeah, I was, uh, I what I was going to really say <laughs> is that uh, we are so excited about this. This is the first uh, formal event that we're offering in Bryan, Texas. The first of many more to come because we've been speaking to people that. Uh, you know we're going to become super super busy in the next little while so if you're wanting a rune reading don't wait and like i said the spots usually the last time we had a rune reading event we had to turn people away so please do not be disappointed get there early because you know we can't you know we're, we're not going to have a turn away lines of people we're going to probably have to do it but i mean please don't get disappointed if you would like to speak with me or have a more in-depth reading, that can be done at a later time, specifically. I would like to say this. It's going to be held at a Revolution Cafe. So what, I, what, I'm, what I'm going to tell you is that whenever you come into the Revolution Cafe, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice place to be. It's a nice place to visit. And you can, uh, you can get you some food and beverages from there, uh, be it coffee or beer or whatever you want from there. Why are you waiting for us? So it's not like you're just going to be sitting there idly bored waiting on us. You can, uh, in a line, you can actually, when you come in, you can see me and I'll put you down on a sheet of paper and then when it's your turn to come up to do the run reading, I'll come get you. So uh, you can actually, uh, they, they have another things going on that day too. They're going to have a band in. Uh, I, I think it's a band. I'm not really sure. I'm going to actually, I'm going to put this out there for you is that, uh, if you're a history buff like I am, this is set in historic downtown um, Bryan. So uh, on that particular night, like I said, they have a huge variety of um, events that they have going on all the time. So I'm going to just tell you, while we're going to be there on March 9th, they're going to actually have a, a live band there. So uh, it's, it's going to be totally, totally... Actually, on March 9th, they're going to have brake lights... From Parts Unknown and Mutant Love. That's who's going to be performing on March 9th. So and they at 211 B South? Yes, 211. So 211 B South Main Street, Bryan, Texas. And their phone number is 979-823-4044. Um, if you have any questions or whatever. But uh, you can uh, definitely come by and see us. And it's considered uh, uh, 211 B South Main Street is actually considered... Carnegie Alley, and for those of you that are local to Bryan, Texas, but uh, uh, this there's going to be, like I said, a live band. So I mean, it's just uh, there's a lot of street, and there's also a parking lot. So uh, rest assured, there's a lot of parking available. And um, in downtown Bryan, it's considered a really magical place, and uh, very you know they have happy hour, they have different kind of you know they they have a lot of specials. So you are going to have a blast. It's one of the coolest looking bars that I've ever seen. I know that when we went down there, uh, they have a Ouija board on the window. A uh, big old Ouija board on the window. The, the, and uh, it's awesome. And uh, accord, you know, the show that's coming on March 9th, there's a lot of people. They have a, fa uh, they have a Facebook page. A lot of people are interested in attending that event and uh, not realizing that we're going to be actually there and uh, there's a lot of people that said that they're actually pumped for the event because, again, brake lights will be there, mutant love, and from parts unknown. So it's yeah, going to be a cool... Uh, it was an event they already had going on, and then at the last minute, we got in on it. So uh, it's going to be pretty cool, I think. I think it's going to be totally awesome. And apparently they say that uh, they have a happy hour until 8.30 p.m., and they, like I said, they have a lot of 
drink specials. So, uh, you know, you're really going to uh, have but a you, blast. <clears throat> but you don't have to be a drinker to enjoy the Revolution Cafe. Because they also have coffee and things of that nature, right? That's right. So, I mean, they have something for everybody there. So, uh, March 9th again is going to be your opportunity to see us up close and personal. And uh, it, it's just, it's going to be awesome. I want to say this too. I mean, in order that, that people, uh, if you want to be different today, uh, to be different is don't drink. Uh, not I'm just saying don't don't like like in our generation we drunk all the time right it's nothing wrong with going out and drinking every now and then <clears throat> and don't get tattoos <clears throat> I'm saying that I know that me and Alexandria gets tattoos but you gotta realize I started getting tattoos in the 80s in the 80s no not hardly anybody was getting tattoos and so uh, that's when I started getting them so I just been collecting over the years <clears throat> and I'll tell you that now it seems like man as soon as people turn like 18 they're getting tattoos and i would just i would just like slow down wait a while you don't have to get it right when you turn 18 because you, your taste in life might change you might realize that you wanted something else there's people getting full body suits before they 20 uh you know what I, i'm gonna chime in on this uh because uh my son i have my son is uh 24 my son nicholas is 24 and uh you know he's seen me getting all my tattoos i have 13 tattoos or I mean I have 13 tattoos no, 12. 12 pardon me I want to get a 13 but I have 12 tattoos very spiritually important to my journey but my son had expressed an interest I when he turned 18 that he wanted to get his first tattoo and I mean you know it, He's an adult at that age, but I just wanted to caution him. I said, be very careful. And I said, really take time to think about what you're doing and uh, make sure that it's something that you would like to have on your body forever. And don't do it to fit in with an, the in crowd. Do it because you want to be an individual and it's important to you. And just be aware that this image is going to be on your body for the rest of your life unless you want to go through the la laser removal, which is, I'm heard, I heard is quite painful. So just, you know, they got other now. Now they got removal creams that work just as well, and they're not uh, as painful. Right. Well, but, but you think about. It, I mean, each tattoo will cost you a minimum a couple hundred dollars. So I mean, you know, shit the, like five, six hundred. That's what I mean. Yeah. You're not going to go into it lightly, and I mean, you know, just be an individual. Don't be a sheep. Don't be a follower. Be a leader in your own life. Yeah, be different. If you want to be different, I mean, our generation that came before you. Well, if you're if you're younger than 40, our generation had come before you getting tattoos like crazy. I mean, I just think the kids today going out and getting full body suits are just being stupid. You know, um, yeah, like I said, I, I got my first tattoo when I was 15. That was in the 80s. And, uh, you know, I went there and I got my tattoo. Back then, they didn't card you like they do today. Um, so I just got my tattoo. And I got it at Eddie Peace Tattoo Studio in Augusta, Georgia. And I think they're still operating, but I, I think that to be different today would be to not get any tattoos, period. You know, I, I think the biggest way that you can be uh, different today is just be yourself and just stand your ground. And uh, if you have to stand alone, then stand alone. But if you can't be true to yourself and you can't be truly yourself, then you, you've, you've really lost your way and uh, you're just uh, a sheep in the herd. Uh, with wolves that are completely circling around you. And if you're not Chinese, if you do get a tattoo and you're not from China, the hell are you getting down Chinese tattoos for? I, I just don't understand. Well, these are just fads or these are people that they maybe see a movie star or they see somebody well, in the public eye. Wow, that looks cool. Not realizing that, okay, uh, are you trying to be like that person or do you want to just be yourself? Like The Rock, the wrestler The Rock, he's Samoan, so he got a tribal tattoo, tribal tattoo that was representative of his culture and i'd be damned if every white irish kid out there went copying the rock and it's like get your own culture if you're going to get something but other than that my recommendations don't get anything well i mean my tattoos are 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 they're about my heritage and they're about my culture and they're uh, spiritual things that are a way of life to me so i don't regret any one of my tattoos because i thought about them for a very very long time prior to getting them so it wasn't a rash decision it was a decision that would involved much thought and contemplation 
Well, just to give y'all some idea on how much thought and contemplation, yeah, I'm, I, I plan on getting a, a, my full body suit, and, but I've I'm, I'm only got a left sleeve and partial back so far. And so uh, I'm, I'm definitely put thought into what I'm getting. So, yeah. Well, that's what we ask. I mean, make sure that you, and do your research too. Make sure you go to an artist that is a true artist that can actually draw. And I mean, a lot of us have, you know, uh, went to people that, you know, you come with an idea or a sketch and by the time they do their, their drawing or their sketch up, it looks like complete crap. And you, you know, you're going to put that on your body? Or like I say, just go to the gym and work out. Don't get any tattoos. So, but uh, yeah, there you go. So that's all I got to say for today. So I, you know, I just want to thank everybody who is uh, listening. Uh, please share them and click on the like button that's very important and uh, you know give us a comment uh, you're allowed to comment on there so if there's something that you don't agree with something you want to talk to you know you want us to talk about in the future let us know I mean we don't know unless we get feedback and feedback is so very very important we're gonna you know in the net we're gonna have a future guest uh, coming to join us with various topics that I think you're going to find very informative, very enlightened, and may give you a different perspective on topics that you think you know about. And, uh, you know, again, education, knowledge, I mean, uh, we hope that you glean something that you may have never thought about when you think about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And again, uh, you know, I don't really call him a monster, really. I think he's just a creature that has been molded into uh, a monster. And, uh, I, you know, I, I can really relate to uh, the creature and uh, the things that he's had to struggle with. Okay, and look, it's getting hot. Is so, it? <laughs> so let's just wrap this up. Well, he, that's just yeah. another word of saying, okay, you're running off at the mouth. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm ready to wrap this up, actually. So, all right, uh, yeah. That was my... You better shut up now. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Yeah, we well, yeah. All right, all right. So we want to say thanks to everybody. Keep sharing, keep liking, and we'll catch you next time. Next time. Bye.